Hello, it's good to be with you, and today we are discussing the last chapter of Marcus Borg's Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. And I've been thinking about the fact that it's been over 20 years since I last read this book, and uh, and I can certainly say that the, then uh, it did feel like meeting Jesus again for the first time. And I imagine a lot of the content of this last chapter about how we understand Jesus's life, uh, his death and the cross, um, really impacted me uh, a lot then, this time through. And I think it has a lot to do with the pandemic and, um, and what we each need at a different moment in our lives. Uh, it was the third chapter, the idea of God is, uh, as compassion and that the word for compassion comes uh, from the word for womb and that, um, and that we are held in the compassion of God uh, really struck me this time through. Uh, but there is a lot in this last chapter, and, um, and it looks at both how we look at uh, uh, Jesus and in the saving work of Jesus uh, and how it affects us as, as Christians. And so I, we'll start with the, the lens of which Marcus Borg uses, and that's that we, um, that we are people of story. The story is, is how we connect to, um, uh, to everything in life, that, that, that our, our lives uh, are reflected through story, and that, that Scripture speaks to us because of the stories in Scripture. Jesus uh, taught so effectively through story, but that the three macro stories that inform all of those other stories um, and I imagine as soon as you uh, uh, start looking at stories uh, that you come across, you'll see that these narratives come out again and again and again. Uh, and the first is the Exodus story, that, um, that God delivered his people out of slavery and, uh, and sustained, that, sustained them in the wilderness uh, and then delivered them to a promised land. Um, uh, and um, the second story is the exile story, that um, that because of uh, a lack of care, that they took this promised land for granted, they took um, their relationship with God for granted, the way they were supposed to care for one another, uh, that when they were exiled during the Babylonian captivity, when they were exiled, uh, they had a deep yearning for home. And it wasn't just uh, to return home, it was to return to the place where they uh, communed with God. It was uh, uh, to return home to a promise, uh, to uh, uh, a community, um, and, and so that yearning for home is, is so deep and, 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 and so ripe um, in that story. Uh, and then the third story is uh, the priestly story. And it's not necessarily from any one particular narrative as much as that priestly tradition uh, of a priest offering sacrifice. Um, uh, people would come to the priest with, uh, with sins, uh, with their guilt around those sins. They would uh, repent of those sins. They'd, you know, asking for forgiveness, uh, a sacrifice would be made and, and they would be assured that they were forgiven. Uh, and, and, and that cycle would repeat. Um, and all of us connect to God through uh, some of that. Um, sometimes we do feel overwhelmed with guilt and the knowledge uh, that God washes us clean, that God forgives us, that we get that uh, tabula rosa, that clean slate, um, that blank tablet um, is, is incredibly, uh, especially when we're overcome by it, uh, in, uh, incredibly assuring. Uh, sometimes, uh, whether it's a, a metaphorical or literal slavery, when we feel bound, when we feel uh, uh, oppressed or or, uh, uh, or held down, uh, God is liberator. Uh, God who liberates us out of poverty, God who liberates us out of slavery, God who liberates us out of whatever it is that holds us down, that uh, that enslaves us, is incredible, uh, incredibly, li uh, not just liberating, but uh, um, but attractive. Uh, and when we're in the wilderness, uh, we feel in the wilderness a uh, God that sustains us, that's with us, that, that, that carries us through, um, and that, that God has a place, uh, an intention for us uh, is strong. And then uh, that yearning for home, that uh, yearning to be uh, within God's embrace, that, uh, um, that, that, uh, that we might find our way or that we might have a deep longing that's uh, innate to us, that um, that is driven towards home and God. Um, that's 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 deep, and and, and that rhythm uh, reverberates deep within us as well. So these narratives definitely speak to us, not just uh, as we look at the life of Jesus, uh, but deep within uh, within our our life and our human experience. And so uh, so it's helpful to have more than one of these stories, uh, and we use these stories as lenses to to look at the Jesus story. Uh, 
Um, and what's dominated the landscape for most of history has been uh, that priestly lens uh, that we look at Jesus and we see uh, that substitutionary theory, that, that theory of atonement that, um, that Jesus came and became the sacrifice, that we were uh, overcome, crippled by our, our, our guilt, by our sins, by our brokenness, um, by that original sin, uh, and God came and sent Jesus um, to, to bear all of those sins, to be our atoning sacrifice, or God's atoning sacrifice for uh, atoning for our sins, um, and so that we might be freed from that sin. Uh, and there's there's variations on that, but but that's the general uh, understanding of it. And um, even that beautiful John three sixteen, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, speaks to that uh, that understanding. And uh, uh, Borg would also argue that the uh, centrality of our uh, confession in in our worship service uh, speaks to that understanding of, of how we are saved by, uh, by confessing our sins, by acknowledging our guilt, by uh, promising that we'll do better, saying oh, we're sorry, promising we'll do better. Uh, God uh, uh, forgives us and we get that blank slate. Um, I, I would argue, and, and interestingly, I haven't used the language of those other two stories, but when I talk about confession uh, to our youth when they're going through confirmation or to adults going through confirmation, uh, I talk about it, uh, one, the way I originally in, uh, experienced it, which was very much through that priestly narrative, uh, to where I am now, where uh, I see it both as liberation, uh, when I am uh, burdened by my sins, when I am uh, crippled uh, by all of the things that I can't seem to uh, to get beyond uh, by my, my human frailty, uh, to be able to uh, acknowledge that before God and, and to be liberated uh, is freeing. Or uh, or also feeling like the, the those sins, those things that I leave undone, or those things that uh, um, that I don't do, you know, feeling separated from God and and from the fullest self that God made me to be. Um, it's a lot like feeling afar a, a from home, um, and that that confession is. Um, is what brings me home, and so, uh, so in my own thought, in the way I experience confession, it's 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 shifted away from that first that first story. Uh, but Borg will bring up a couple other things that he sees in that uh, priestly story that uh, that he struggles with, and and, and one uh, he sees it somewhat as a loop. He, uh, 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 you know, we go in, we acknowledge our guilt, we say we're sorry. Um, uh, we repent, we're gonna do better next time. God promises to forgive us. Uh, we leave and we come back again guilty uh, and we go through this process and, and, and it is very much a, a loop. Um, and in some ways it's a little bit of a passive loop. Um, we're not um, an active participant other than the uh, saying, I'm sorry. Uh, it's God who's, who's, who's the actor um, and, and it leaves us fairly passive. Um, and, and, and it can be a, a passive Christian life, that, uh, which goes to the next one, that it's so uh, uh, focused on, uh, on ascent to heaven, you know, that, uh, uh, that we acknowledge this truth, this historical um, uh, and uh, eternal reality that Christ came for our sins, that he died for our sins, uh, and uh, we inherit that, uh, that promise of eternal life. And, and that's, in a nutshell, our Christian identity. And, uh, and Borg uh, expresses that that misses so much of it and that there's so much more um, that, that can be experienced. Uh, he also uh, would argue that uh, as, um, as unconditional as it seems, uh, there's a pretty big condition on that. The, the caveat is, if you believe, um, you inherit this, um, this promise, uh, this eternal life. And so, uh, so we'd argue it's not as unconditional as, as it seems. Uh, and there's some other things that he uh, goes into detail about uh, about wrestling with that. And not that he's throwing it out, but he says, you know, when it becomes the primary lens, uh, it has a, a lot of limits um, and, uh, and encourages us to, to understand uh, the other two narratives and, and how they speak to us. Uh, uh, Jesus as, as liberator who came to uh, show us a God who, who deeply... Uh, uh, wants us unshackled from from sin, uh, from uh, all of the the powers of this life that um, that oppress us. In fact, I like the way Borg, um, uh, sort of tongue in cheek, talks about 
uh, Moses going to the people of, uh, of Israel as they're imprisoned in, in Egypt and saying, uh, no worries, uh, your sins are forgiven, uh, that it wouldn't be all that liberating for them as they still have their shackles around their, their, around their arms and ankles. Um, you know, and, and, and much less tongue in cheek and, and, uh, uh, and devastating, you know, the, the narrative and the pervasiveness of, of forgiveness um, as, as, as the primary um, uh, mode of operandi with God and, uh, and God's people uh, can leave somebody who's bound by uh, abuse or, or, or other uh, real broken aspects of a relationship feeling that um, that the response uh, of the church uh, is to is to continue to forgive instead of uh, understanding a God who deeply, deeply uh, desires uh, uh, her liberation or, or his liberation uh, from that abusive relationship, from uh, the things that uh, that hold life down and uh, limit the the fullest self from being able to emerge. So, uh, so all of these have have, have deep roots and and. Um, you know, obviously, you can see the places that liberation theology has really taken off. Um, uh, folks who, uh, who whether it's uh, the, the slavery of uh, of oppressive government regimes, literal slavery, poverty, um, uh, patriarchal communities, uh, you name it, um, uh, or just the uh, the enslavement that that each of us experiences in in, in different ways. Um, the idea of Jesus who came to, to, to set us free, to, uh, to help us understand a God who deeply desires us to, to be free to fully, uh, fully express and be uh, the person that God made us to be um, and who liberates us from our sin and our brokenness uh, is, is incredibly powerful. Um, and then also um, uh, the God who draws us all, um, you know, so we, uh, stretched out upon the hardwood of the cross so that all people might come within his loving embrace. Uh, that God who uh, is always bringing us home, um, who gave himself as the, the revelation of, uh, of how deeply uh, God's nature is love and how deeply that embrace desires all of us um, to be nestled in um, under, uh, under those loving arms. Um, those narratives help, uh, help give us a broader sense of, uh, of what it is to be saved by Jesus. It also gives us a sense of, uh, of journey in our lives, that, uh, uh, that our Christian life is a journey, and it's about uh, not necessarily a moment of liberation, uh, uh, but of liberating ourselves from the things of this, uh, of this life uh, so that we can be free to be the, the, the person that God has, has made us to be. Um, or or the journeying home, the journeying towards God, uh, that that is often a lifetime journey, um, and it's also the ways that God uh, encounters us in our human condition. That that God finds uh, all sorts uh, of matter uh, uh, and, and 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 ways of being and 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 places in our lives, and God meets us there. Um, and it's a God of hope uh, who 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 pulls us from there and 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 journeys with us. Uh, uh, and I think that, uh, that when we put those together, we get a, a, a pretty robust sense of, of, of who God is um, and how God is individually and corporately uh, drawing us into that divine life, uh, which speaks to the last point of Borg. And, uh, uh, and he would argue that uh, the Christianity isn't subscribing to a, a, a series of beliefs, uh, creeds, or, or, or ideas as much as it is uh, becoming uh, with God, uh, of drawing our lives, of bending our hearts, minds, bodies, souls, uh, our beings uh, towards uh, towards the transformation um, of of oneness with God, uh, that uh, that the divine life, the life in the the Easter uh, Jesus, is a transformed life, and that uh, all of us, when we we kind of come to understand the wholeness, the fullness of who of, of who God is and who God is revealed to be uh, in Jesus. Uh, don't just uh, nod our heads and, and understand the facts of it, uh, but but draw our lives towards the God who desperately wants um, our hearts, uh, our bodies, our, our lives uh, rendered towards towards that God who is compassion, uh, who wants us to dwell in him like a, a child and a woman. Um, so when we meet that Jesus, it is it is a transforming moment. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, reading the book. I hope this last chapter uh, connected with you in some way, and uh, and I wish you God's blessing. Bye.